Welcome to Family Sunday. Welcome to Family Sunday. Woo! Let me hear from the kids. Kids, let me hear you. Yeah. All right, I'm going to count to three, and then I want to hear all the kids yell as loud as, well, not as loud as you can. Just, I want all the kids to let me know where you are. Okay, one, two, two and a half, three. Yes. Love you guys. You guys are so welcome here. You know, Jesus says that, that you're what the whole, this is all about, is about you guys, about you kids, for such is the kingdom of heaven. Amen? Amen. Do not despise having the children here. Do not despise the fact that we don't have kids class today because Jesus wants to do something unique and something special. We're going to talk about building today, and we're going to talk about... The house on the rock. I call this message homeowner's insurance. So um, this is a passage where Jesus, this is one of the most common parables. And um, it's in both Luke 6 and in Matthew 7. We're going to focus on Luke chapter 6. So if you'd open your Bible to Luke, it's in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke. And chapter 6. We're going to read starting with verse 46, all right? So here, Jesus has just talked about some really tough things. Okay, I'm going to take this off because it's ruining my hair. How's my hair look now? <laughs> like you guys would really tell me. <laughs> okay. Jesus has just said some really hard things. He has gone on um, and talked about pretty much everything you could possibly talk about. And here he says, at the end of this, he says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and then you don't even do what I say? What he's saying, okay, so Lord, hi Siri. (laughs) We actually have our own Siri here. (laughs) Spirit of control, but um, but this is what this is what he's saying. He's saying, "Why do you call me Lord?" That's not his name. His name isn't Lord. It, that means he is your master. That you belong to him. He's saying, "Why do you say that you're my followers and you don't even do what I tell you to do? Do as I say." That's what Jesus is saying. Do as I say. And he's not saying it because he's got some control problem. He's saying it because he wants us to live a life of blessing and fulfillment and peace and joy and stability. He actually wants us to live lives of stability. And we're going to talk about this when we talk about a solid foundation. All right, we're going to read this story. We're going to read it in two chunks. Luke chapter 6, verse 47 Jesus says, I'll show you what someone is like who comes to me, who hears my words, and who acts on them. Kids, how many of you, when your mom tells you to go clean your room, you run right in your room and clean it up perfectly? How many kids? Raise your hands. I don't see a (laughs) seat. Most of us, like children... We hear something, as Eli expressed, and what do we say? No. But is that what we're supposed to say? Kids, when your mom or dad tells you to go clean your room, are you supposed to say no? What are you supposed to say? Yes. And there's two words that can never go together. These are the two words that can never, ever, 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 ever go together. No, Lord, Those two words can't go together. The only words that can go together if you're a true follower of Jesus are, yes, Lord. Can we say that together? Yes. And by the end of this message, I hope that that is what resonates in your heart, that you will say, yes, Lord, to whatever it is the Holy Spirit's calling you to do. As I've mentioned before, there's always two messages going on. There's what I'm saying. But more importantly, there's what the Holy Spirit is saying to you as an individual. There's something that the Holy Spirit wants to speak. And as I look around this room, I think there's something he wants to say to each and every one of us. 
There's a deeper level that he wants to take us. So Luke 6, I'll show you what someone is like who comes to me, hears my words, and acts on them. That is the pivotal phrase right there. He acts on them. He's like a man who builds a house, who dug deep. Say that with me. Dug deep. And he laid the foundation on the what? On the rock, the bedrock. And it says, and when the flood came, the river crashed against that house and couldn't shake it because it was what? It was well built. Okay, this is what Jesus is saying. If you're somebody who calls him Lord, if you say, I'm a Christian, you say, I'm a disciple of Jesus, I'm a follower of Jesus, there is a prerequisite. And that is not only do you come to him, not only do you hear his words, but you act on them. You say, yes, Lord, and you do what he has asked you to do. Otherwise, you may need to question whether you're his disciple or not, or whether you really truly belong to him. And we're going we're gonna to get into this a little bit more, but the, the three things are you come to Jesus, which means surrendering, giving yourself fully to him, saying, Lord, you know, we, we sing some scary stuff. I don't know if you realize this, but when we sing, Lord, I surrender, do we really? You're like, Lord, I surrender to you. My life is yours. What? I have to wear a mask to church? Right? Or what? I have to give 10% of my earnings to God? Or what? I have to serve someone else? Because they're so quiet. Right? It's like Jesus went to the cross and suffered and paid the penalty, and yet, we don't want to step out of our comfort zone. I saw this really cool meme. It said, um, uh, some of you are really angry about having to wear a mask to church, but the fact is you've been wearing a mask to church for years. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> I knew I could offend someone. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so basically this, this story is about two different contractors, if you will, two different construction guys that are going to build houses. I, uh, recently, I had water damage in my house. The, the connector hose to my dishwasher was not connected, so it wasn't actually a connector hose. It was a disconnector hose, but anyway, there was a slow leak, a slow drip on my hardwood floor. Yeah, and, and one morning I went downstairs and I was like, oh, whoa, what, what was that? And it was like all like rippled like this. And uh, so I called in a contractor because you know, if you want to file a claim with your homeowner's insurance, you have to have people come in and assess it and tell you how much it's going to cost and everything. Well, the first guy that came in, he came in and he goes, oh yeah, this is bad. This is really bad. You're going to have to rip out all of your cabinets. You're going to have to rip out all of your countertops, all of the backsplash, everything. Well, I just remodeled the kitchen six years ago, and it's actually when my husband was still alive, so we kind of did it together. So it was a super emotional thing for me to hear this. It was a really uncomfortable thing for me to hear, like I'm going to be living in chaos, basically, because if you've ever remodeled, you know that that, that is the closest thing to hell. Really, <laughs> it's the worst. <clears throat> I'm sorry, it's really not. But anyway, but so there's these two contractors. So this first contractor comes in, he gives me the worst. Then the second guy comes in, because I thought I'm getting a second opinion, rather than living in that kind of a mess for however many months. So the second guy comes in, he goes, oh yeah, this isn't that bad. We can fix that up easily. I'm like, I almost ripped out my entire kitchen and lived in chaos for four months. But the second guy came and he said, you don't need to do that. And it just reminds me of these two contractors who are building their house. The first guy, he was like all about do it, take it all apart, do everything, which I, ever, I never ended up doing because I don't know if you know this or not, but if you let hardwood dry out, it will eventually flatten out. I'm sorry to say that to all you flooring guys because I know this is how you make your living, sorry. But it actually just flattened out, so it was pretty awesome. But anyway, let's talk about this shovel. 
I know this is a snow shovel. I'm from Minnesota. I am well aware this is a snow shovel. <laughs> Can I tell you a little story? When I was growing up, I'm not waiting for permission. When I was growing up, it would snow so hard and blow so strong that my mom's best friend had this house and the the snow would drift all the way up to the very roof of their house and we would get on a toboggan or a sled and we would slide all the way down from the very top of the house all the way down into a field. <laughs> One of the advantages of living in Minnesota. Okay, but let's imagine that this is actually a shovel. I forgot my actual shovel. So if you dig and dig, let's pretend it's snow and dig, and dig, and dig, suddenly, what happens? You hit solid ground. And this is the same thing that this is talking about with this builder. It says that, that he came and he laid his foundation on a rock, which really means bedrock, which is actually the top crust, the top layer of the earth. And whenever they talk about it, whenever they describe it, they call it, um, they call anything that's up on top of that bedrock, they call that unconsolidated substances or unconsolidated, which means they don't hold together, which means it's like sand or gravel or rocks or loose, even loose boulders. Those are the things you're not supposed to build your house on. But what Jesus is actually talking about is that he himself is the rock. Throughout the Bible, it says the rock is Christ. And he's saying, build your house on a solid foundation. Build your house on the truth, capital T truth, which is Jesus. You know, a lot of people quote that, that verse that says, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. I just want to tell you, that is not just talking about like knowing facts or knowing like that the Packers lost last week. <laughs> Sorry, Packers fans, we got some fans over there that are so glad. I mean, does that set anybody free? I mean... How about um, gravity will hold you down on the earth? You don't have to worry about that. Does that really actually set you free? Or, or to know that, um, that gas prices are, are low. I mean, who feels freer knowing that? I mean, it may be truckers, but, but really, that's not the truth. What this is talking about is the truth the gospel truth of Jesus Christ, that he is the way and the truth and the life. He is the only way. And what he's saying is, don't try to build your house on anything else except me. And he's not saying that because he's selfish or controlling. He's saying that because he knows what we need even before we ask. And so he's saying, when you build your house, build it on me. Build it on my principles. Build it on my word. Know what it says in my word so that you can build your house on something that is never gonna be shaken when the storms come. Because guess what? The storms are gonna come. I know there's a, there's a whole prosperity gospel that says, well, if you know the Lord... And if you've given your life to the Lord, you will never suffer. That is a crock. I do not, believe me, I have looked. I do not read that. What I read is that everyone will experience storms. Everyone. It, it says in the Bible that, that it rains on the just and the unjust alike. There's no difference between that. But there are four words in the Bible that are used for the term house. The first word is your life. When it talks about building your house, this is what Jesus is talking about here. Build your life. Build your belief system. Build whatever it is with that your foundational principles, your morality, whatever it is. Build that on truth, on the rock, on Jesus Christ. The second use of the term house is for your, for your family, like your home, your family. Like, what is your family like? Is your family based on biblical principles? Do you parent from biblical principles? Do you, as a married couple, 
actually follow the teachings of Jesus in the way that you relate to one another? Ooh, that's convicting, huh? Husbands, do you treat your wives like Jesus treats us? Wives, do you honor your husbands the way that Jesus calls us to honor him? Or do we get lazy? Okay, moving on. So the second one is family. Okay, the third one is the church, the house of God, or your ministry, that which you are called to do and to be. As a church, we exist um, for three reasons. We exist so that you will grow your life, impact your world, and live your dream. In other words, we believe that the, the important, the most important thing you can do is to know Christ and the power of his suffering and sharing in his resurrection, to know Jesus, to build your house on that solid foundation that's never going to shake, never going to crack, never going to be destroyed, never going to blow away like everything else on top of it could. Okay, so we believe that that is the most important thing you could possibly do is to know Jesus. And Jesus even says that that is the one thing that's needed is to know him. The second thing that we believe is that you should impact your world. You know, they say, why would, why, if Jesus didn't want us to impact other people's lives, he would have just saved us and taken us right to heaven. But he leaves us here for a reason. And that is because he wants us to have an actual imprint on the lives of the people around us. He wants us to actually be a light in the darkness. He actually wants to be the salt that preserves and heals and restores people. So we believe that you grow your own life, you impact your world, and that you live your dream. Every one of us was created for a purpose. Every single person. And I know there's a lot of people that are like, oh, I know, I'm the exception. God didn't give me any talents. God didn't give me any gifts. No, that is not true. Maybe your gift is interceding for people, just praying. Maybe that's your gift. Maybe your gift is you're behind the scenes. You're just cleaning things. You're just making things ready so that other people can come. Maybe your gift is just giving, being generous, secretly giving people money, supporting ministries, supporting other people. Maybe that's your ministry. It doesn't have to be just the only important ministries are the ones that are upfront and obvious. I mean, the Bible says we've already received our reward. You guys that do all this stuff in secret, that's where your reward is. And so who's, who knows? But you are. Everybody has a dream within them that God has, has placed. Sometimes it's buried a little bit deep down beneath some pain. But ultimately, you are created for a purpose. And one of the reasons we exist as a church is to help encourage people to live their dream. Look at Eli. Look at that guy that just did that last pandemic story. <clears throat> I mean, that guy is a leader, and he is having an influence on some really tough, tough guys. I don't know if you know, he works in the railroad industry. He didn't say that. And, and those guys, some of those guys are tough. But Eli is being used of the Lord to impact his world and to help others discover who Jesus created them to be. And that is building his ministry, building his purpose and that's what we're all called to do, to build our own personal lives, our families, but also to build the body of Christ, which is the church. Amen? Amen? That's all you got? Okay, one more time. Come on. Amen. That is what we are called to. And then the last thing is to build our culture or to build our society. We are, as I mentioned, we are supposed to be light in the world. This is not talking about posting on Facebook about who you're voting for or who you, you know, political. I am so sorry. This is not about that. This is being a light. Some of you are not being a light. Some of you are light snuffers, okay? Well, I, I grew up Lutheran and we used to have these, these things. They look like a bell and they were on like this this handle, they were really fancy, but they would snuff out candles and whoever got to be like the altar person that day would get to go and shh, shh. Some of you are doing that on Facebook and Instagram. And instead of building people up, you're pushing people away. 
I didn't mean to go off on this tangent, but I'm not going to apologize. Use your social media to be a light. Use your social media to build others up, to encourage one another and build each other up. Amen? Amen? Half of you? The other half now. Amen? Amen. <laughs> okay. All right. So that's your solid foundation. That is the bedrock. That is what Jesus is saying. Build your house, build your family, build your ministry or the church, and build a society on truth, on Jesus Christ, on the rock. Okay, so a sandy foundation. Sandy foundation. I traveled around. I did a backpacking thing um, when I was looking for the meaning of life, and I, and I backpacked throughout Europe, and um, I went to this little place, which I do not recommend, called Pisa. Anybody heard of Pisa? How about if I say the leaning tower of... Okay, now you've heard of it. Don't even do it. Don't waste your time. There's only two things in Pisa. There's the, the leaning tower. Pisa, incidentally, means marshy. What was your first clue? You should not have built a tower there. <laughs> I mean, the thing is just like gradually, it's like, why? Anyway, um, and then there are just merchants there selling uh, little replicas of the leaning tower of Pisa. So just avoid it if you travel. But the thing is, Pisa has a terrible foundation. It's just like a super unstable foundation. It's unconsolidated, which means it has all kinds of things that can fall apart. Contrast that with the Burj Khalifa, which is the tallest building in the world. It's 160 stories. Get this. The foundation for the Burj Khalifa goes 97 yards this is the, the length of a football field below the surface till they get to the bedrock, till they hit the rock. That is the Burj Khalifa. If you ever, say for example, let's imagine, so the top part of this is the building. The bottom part is under the surface. Under this is the foundation. I mean, it looks like a weak foundation, but let's imagine it's like massive. Below the surface. Now, let's say you didn't build it like that. You just built it like this. Look at that. It's very unstable. Contrast that with, try to move things. It doesn't move nearly as much. And that is the thing that Jesus is talking about. Build on something that's solid so it won't shake what's on the top, as opposed to the sandy, unconsolidated substances of gravel and rocks and sand. Stuff that doesn't matter. What this is talking about, this house that he's building, is compared to the things of this world, which are temporary. And Jesus reminds us over and over and over again, build your life on things that are eternal, not things that are going to fade away, not stuff that's going to get rusty or that moths are going to eat or somebody can steal. Don't build your life on those things. Build your lives on things that are solid, right? Luke 6, 49, here he says, the one who hears my words and does not do what? Does not act. This means he hears the word. So this means he's a believer. He's heard the same words. He's heard the same thing as the first contractor, but he doesn't do it. He's like, no, I know better. It says he built his house on the ground without a foundation, right? And what happens? The river crashed against it and immediately it collapsed. And the destruction of that house was great. Okay, so there's two contractors here. They have a lot of things in common. Number one, they both wanted to build a house. Number two, they both heard the words of Jesus. They heard truth. And they both set out to build a house. But there's a difference. Actually, there are several differences. Oh, another thing that's similar, they both faced a storm, right? Both of these contractors had the storm come against their house. But the difference was one built on a foundation that was solid, that was a rock. The other one built it on marsh or sand or unconsolidated substances. The only thing that will reveal your character, honestly, and actually develop your character is going through storms. 
Because both of these guys went through storms. The guy that built his house on the rock went through storm. And the guy who built his house on the sand went through a storm. And you know, there's two kinds of Christians. I'm going to offend somebody again. Number one, there's a true believer who trusts in the Lord with all their heart and leans not on their own understanding. They do what Jesus tells them to do. They say, yes, Lord. They lay down their lives for others. They serve and honor. They give. They bless. They care about others. They are, their hearts are filled with the Holy Spirit and they're loving. There's those. And then there's the fake Christians. There's the ones who say that they're believers, but their lives say something else. And when that storm hits, that's when the truth comes out. These are are people that just consume. They just take, 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 take. And they never give of themselves or their money or their gifts or their love or their grace. And that's what this is talking about. It's built on a sandy foundation. It's built on their own philosophies or the ways of the world or whatever. And Jesus is like, don't build on temporary things. Build on something that is unshakable, the rock, which is Christ. Amen? Amen? And you also have to ask yourself, am I a wise builder or am I a foolish builder? Am I building my life and everything I do on the rock, which is Christ, or am I building it on myself and maybe my career or my relationships or my philosophies or any of these things that can be instantly taken away? The storms are what reveal who you really are. Are you a consumer or are you a true believer? And it's not too late. They both look the same on the outside, but when the storms hit, and the storms will hit, there you could lose your job. The coronavirus, need I say more? A storm, that was a major storm for many people, and it shook the foundation for many. You could lose a spouse, or a child, or a loved one, or you could be betrayed by a friend, or you could lose your job, or you could get a cancer diagnosis. Any of these things can happen in a second. These are the storms of life that come to both the the just and the unjust, the righteous and the unrighteous, the holy and the unholy, those who believe in Jesus and surrender to him, and those who want to do it on their own. These storms are going to come. You can prepare for the storm, though. In my class right now, I'm in graduate school getting, uh, getting a master's, and they're talking about futuring in this class that I'm in, which is talking about how to take what you know of past trends and what current trends are happening and how to try to gauge what might happen in the future, how to prepare for something that might happen. And there's another method of futuring that's just backwards. It's called back casting. It's not back masking. It's back casting, which means that you You have a goal, you you see what you'd want to see, or you see a potential problem in the future, and then you work backwards to the point of, what can I do to prepare to either encourage this thing to happen if it's good, or to prevent it from happening if it's bad? And that is what the Holy Spirit, I believe, is calling us to do, is to say, how can I live a life that when I stand before Jesus, he looks at me and says, well done good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of the Lord. Because this verse here where it says, the river crashed against the house, this is verse 49, and immediately collapsed. It says, the destruction of that house was great. Doesn't mean great like, yay, great. It means great like intense. It means it was terrible. It was horrible. And Jesus says, unless you build your life on me, The storms are going to hit, and it could result in destruction. And this could even result in eternal destruction. Remember the two words you can't say, no, Lord. You can only say, yes, Lord, because ultimately, the Bible says, in the last days on the judgment, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Some people, that is going to be the greatest day ever. For those who are building their lives on the rock, but for those who are building it on the sand, that's going to be the worst day of their lives because it could result in an eternity without the God of love, without the God of compassion and mercy, without 
the forgiveness of sins that Jesus offered on the cross. You know, we remodeled our house in California. And like I said, for those who have remodeled, it's terrible. But I remember we were doubling the size of our master bedroom because it was like eight by eight or something tiny. And so we were doubling the size of it. And they went in there and they were digging out this foundation and it just took forever. And I remember sitting there one day, I had, I had little toddlers and, and it was a stressful, stressful time. But I remember sitting one day just praying and looking out at just this mess that this foundation was causing in my yard. <laughs> my yard was just completely uprooted. And the Holy Spirit said, that is the condition of your heart right now. And that's how it felt. And I believe the Lord showed me that that is the condition of some of your hearts right now, that the coronavirus may have uprooted some things in you. Or maybe just the, the storms of life have uprooted some of the things within you. And Jesus wants to say right now, it's not too late to start building your house on a foundation that is firm. It is not too late. Even though this storm has already hit, it's okay because he's saying, I'm going to give you a do-over because he is a God of grace and mercy and compassion. And Jesus is a God of do-overs. That is what grace is about. He is a God who says, I'm going to forgive again and you are going to be blessed. And he wants to draw you close to him. Would you stand with me now as we just kind of pray about this house on the rock, building your house on the rock? And I, I, have, I have a couple of groups I want to just address. I think there are those of you and you have built your house on the rock, but you're not really believing that when those storms hit, that it's going to be solid, that it's going to be a firm foundation. And I really believe it's, we sang that song that we're not a slave to fear any longer. We don't have to live in fear. We can trust in the Lord with all our hearts. So there's that first group. And then the second group is you realize this morning that you have built your house on things that are not eternal. You built your house on things that are, that are going to be washed away when the storm hits. They're not eternal things. And the Lord is saying, it's not too late. You can, you can start to build on the rock. You can start to read this. You can start to get into God's presence, just having conversations with him, just talking to him, pouring out your heart to him. And he's saying, he's still stands there and waits. It says that his kindness is what leads us to change. His kindness is the thing that draws us in. So there's that second group. And then the third group, you have never heard any of this and you've never received the forgiveness that Jesus offered for you on the cross so you could be reconciled to your father. And so I wanna pray for all three of you groups and, and just acknowledge it between you and your maker. You know, he's, he's here. We invited his spirit here. Do you sense his presence? The spirit of the Lord is here. The atmosphere is changing. The spirit of the Lord is here. Father, we come before you, Lord, and we thank you that you are such a God of mercy and grace and kindness. I thank you so much for this story of these two builders, Lord. I thank you that, that you are the one who provides our insurance, our homeowner's insurance, Lord. As we build our house, Lord, let us build it unto you. Lord, let us build our home on truth. Let us build our life and our family and our church and our culture and our society, Lord, on you in the name of Jesus. Father, and we just ask, Lord, for those who are, who are struggling with fear right now, fear of the future, fear of COVID, fear of the economy, fear of a, of a health diagnosis, fear of losing a relationship, Lord, right now in the name of Jesus, we stand against fear. Lord, your word says that perfect love casts out fear. If you're a person and you're struggling with fear, just I just want to ask you to just raise your hand, not for any judgment. Lord, we just, we, we just come together with those who are 
anxious right now, who are struggling with fear. And Lord, we thank you that you are the Prince of Peace. Demonstrate your peace right now to these as they come to you, Lord. Set them free. Lord, I just speak Psalm 112. Lord, they will have no fear of bad news. Their hearts will be steadfast, trusting in you forever. And now for that second group, you realize this morning that you haven't built your home on a solid foundation. You haven't built it on the rock, the bedrock that will never be shaken. And the Lord is telling you this morning, you can just change your mind and begin to live for him fully. If that's you, could you just slip up your hand right now? If you realized your life has been built on sand, All right, well, Lord, we just, um, God, we thank you for the fact that we can humble ourselves before you. Lord, we thank you that you will never turn us away. Lord, we thank you that you are for us. You are not against us. Lord, and in the name of Jesus, for those who have built their homes on something other than you, other than your truth, Lord, I just ask, God, you would give them a new way. You would show them your goodness, Lord. Show them your mercy. Show them your kindness and your forgiveness. In Jesus' name. Now, for those of you, if you have never surrendered to Jesus, you've never given yourself fully to him, you've never received the forgiveness that he offers, you're still walking around with shame. If that's you, would you just slip your hand up and say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Anybody? All right, well, Father, we just pray for the church. Lord, you would pour out a spirit of evangelism. Lord, that that we would not be obnoxious, Lord, but that we would be a light, that people would be drawn to you because of us. Lord, that our words would be seasoned with salt. We would speak words of encouragement and life and truth. And we bless you, Lord. We thank you for who you are. We thank you, Jesus, that you are the rock, Lord, and that you will never be shaken in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I love you guys so much. We'll see you next week. Go out and be a light to your dark neighborhoods and your dark grocery stores and your dark workplaces. Amen. All right. Love you guys.